Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jane. You both very eloquent, and you said all the kinds of things I would have liked to have said about other people when I had the same job. And thank you all. Thanks to everyone for coming out this evening. Uh, I am especially and enormously happy to be launching the publication of the most powerful idea in the world in the same library in which so much of it was written. Uh, over the three plus years between June 23rd, 2006, which is the day I started work on this project, uh, to March 1st of this year, which is the date I answered the last query from the Random House Production Department. Uh, for those of you attempting to calculate this in your heads, that is 1,346 days. Now, if you're wondering how I know the precise date when I started work on this project, it's because the idea to write a book about the steam revolution came to me, I swear, in the early morning hours of Friday, June 23rd, almost exactly four years ago. I wrote down the idea on this piece of paper, which has been in my closet ever since. Put it away and went back to sleep. Now you may be asking yourselves where this attention to, shall we say, artificially precise dates actually comes from. It is not evidence of an obsessive compulsive disorder, or at least it's not only that. It is, however, what happens when you spend years of your life reading uh, historical books, historical articles, uh, monographs, and that is because one of the historian's most seductive conceits is the notion that important events, even a civilization's great turning points, can be precisely dated, can be marked to the very day. And in that spirit, I'd like you to consider the possibility that on Monday, July 25th, 1698, an anonymous clerk employed by the Royal Seal Patent Office, Great Seal Patent Office on Southampton Row, three blocks from the present day site of the British Museum, started the Industrial Revolution and ushered in the modern world. The patent application he granted was entitled a new invention for raising of water and occasioning motion to all sorts of millwork by the impellent force of fire, a steam engine. Now, everyone knows that a steam engine is a pretty important bit of technological history, but I'm going to try and persuade you tonight that it's something even bigger. That the steam engine is the most significant invention in all of human history, more significant than movable type or gunpowder or the telephone or internal combustion or the internet or even the wheel. I realize this is a bold claim. I understand some of you may now be thinking that a man who spends 1,346 days on a single subject might be risking a loss of perspective. <laughs> but bear with me. The most powerful idea in the world is essentially the story of how, where, when, and why the steam engine became so significant. But tonight I'm going to try and boil those 400 pages down to three separate arguments in support of this assertion. First, that the steam engine is responsible for an historically unprecedented change in human welfare. Second, that it's the first example of an historically unprecedented kind of invention. And third, that it was created by an historically unprecedented population of inventors. Okay, first argument. The first argument on behalf of the overwhelming significance of the steam engine is this. Despite thousands of wars, migrations, discoveries, the rise and fall of empires, the birth of a hundred different religions, only once in the last 10,000 years has something happened that truly transformed the life of the average person, or the typical family. And this is because by any quantifiable measure, including how long the average person lived, or how well, the lived experience of virtually all of humanity didn't change much for millennia after humanity discovered, more than 10,000 years ago, how to grow food. The agricultural revolution spread around the globe. And what this means is that whether you are an Aztec peasant or a Babylonian shepherd, an Athenian stonemason in the time of Pericles, or a German merchant in the days of Charlemagne, if you spoke different languages, wore different clothing, you prayed to different deities, but you would have eaten about the same amount of food, lived the same number of years, traveled no farther or faster from your homes, and buried just as many of your children before the age of five. And that, in turn, is because while humanity produced a lot more children, worldwide population grew uh, between 5,000 B.C. and 1,600 A.D. from five to 500 million, they did not, on average, make a whole lot of anything else. As you can see, the line representing population always stays just a bit ahead of the one showing the total quantity of goods and services produced by that population. That's the measure that we usually call gross domestic product. Now, the first person to explain why the average human living in the 17th century AD was as impoverished as his or her counterpart in the 7th century BC was the English demographer Thomas Malthus. 
whose essay on the principle of population demonstrated that throughout human history, population had always increased faster than food supply. That population, unless unchecked by things like wars or famines or epidemic disease or similarly unappreciated bits of news, always increased geometrically, while the resources needed by that population, primarily food, always increased arithmetically. Um, you'd be using the term geometric, uh, you'd be using it as exponential and linear if you were writing it in a math paper today. The Malthusian trap, this term is not original with me, ensured that though mankind regularly discovered or invented new ways of feeding, clothing, transporting, or more frequently killing itself, the resulting population increase quickly consumed any surplus, leaving everyone in precisely the same place as before, or frequently way behind, as populations exploded and then crashed when food ran out and famine took its place. By the way, if you're unsure whether gross domestic product is the best measuring stick, you are correct, sort of. The measurement that matters is per capita GDP. The, measure, the value of goods and services the average person produces. And that chart looks very different. The best estimates for human productivity, a very vague and imprecise set of numbers, but I'd like to here offer thanks to the economic historians who have calculated them on our behalf, puts annual per capita GDP as expressed in a constant number. Here it's 1990 US dollars, fluctuating between 400 and $550 a year for 7,000 years. Worldwide per capita GDP in 800 BC, a little over $540, is virtually identical to the same number in 1600, which means that the average person of William Shakespeare's time produced no more and in consequence lived no better than his counterpart in the days of Homer. Now that chart, to me, is pretty impressive on its own, but it's also very strongly correlated with a whole lot of other things that matter a whole lot to human welfare, like, for example, mortality at birth. In fact, mortality at any age. We could chart a dozen other things, like the average height of adults, the number of rooms per person, the annual hours of leisure time, the percentage of literate adults. It would have almost exactly the same shape as the lifespan chart. Or we could do the opposite, chart the prevalence of infectious disease, the percentage of lifetime spent disabled, the percentage of population living in poverty chart would look the same, only upside down. This phenomenon is not restricted to Europe and North America either. A baby born in France in the year 1800 could expect to live only about 30 more years. That's 25 years less than a baby born in the Republic of the Congo in the year 2000. The 19th century French infant would be at significantly greater risk of starvation, infectious disease, and even violence. And were he or she to survive into adulthood would be far less likely even to learn how to read. And then, just as that baby was being born in 1800 France, for the first time in history, things changed. And here's a really great way to explain how much. William Nordhaus, an economist up at Yale, who's one of those economists to whom we are grateful for those GDP on over time figures, has calculated how long it took the average laborer to pay for an hour of reading light using the best available technology, sesame oil lamps, candles, uh, gas, and so on. In medieval England, it cost more than seven hours to buy one hour of illumination. By 1800, still more than five. Today, it costs less than one half a second. And that, it seems to me, is a pretty good case for the Industrial Revolution as the most transformative era in history, at least in any way transformation can be measured. That's when the line describing human, average human productivity and therefore human welfare made that turn like the business end of a hockey stick. But it isn't by itself an argument for the steam engine is the most significant invention in history, which, as I'm sure you'll recall, is what I promised you. There are stories in the most powerful idea in the world of dozens of signature inventions of the industrial age. Some of them will be familiar to you from high school history, the spinning jenny, the flying shuttle, and such. Steam power wasn't even at first the engine that powered industrialization. Even a century after that first steam engine patent was awarded in 1698, Windmills and water wheels in Britain were still providing more than three times as much power as steam. And that's why the second argument for the steam engine is the most significant single invention in history rests on the fact that it isn't a single invention at all. It is instead the first great technological innovation that is an entire family of inventions. And that's a clue as to why it is responsible for such a dramatic historical transformation. I'm not attempting to be cryptic here. The opening scene in the most powerful idea in the world takes place in London's Science Museum, in front of what is almost certainly 
the most famous locomotive in the world.